Hello there and welcome to the latest edition of The Front Page, the Racing Post news analysis programme. And once again, we'll be examining some of the biggest ongoing stories in the sport of horse racing. But there is, of course, no doubt what the most important story in our racing world has been since this programme last aired. The death of Jack de Bromhead at the age of just 13 leaves his family and friends cruelly robbed. There are no adequate words at a time like this, but all of us here at the Racing Post send our very sincerest condolences and support to the whole de Bromhead family and all those who loved Jack. My name is Lee Mottisett and I'm joined this week by my Racing Post colleagues James Stevens and Keith Melrose and James here. You have been on the road. Talk about where you've been in the last week. Yeah, so it's September officially, so we can start thinking about the jump season. It may yeah. be a little bit yeah, early, but yeah. the horses are back in training and it's it's gearing up with excitement. So on Tuesday, I went to see Jane Williams, um, which is soon to be Jane and Chester Williams, yeah. and Nicky Martin, who's got a really lovely novice chaser for the season called Bear Gills, yes. who could be very exciting. Um, on Friday, I was down to see Harry Fry and Anthony Honeyball, who have t got two nice yards, two sort of emerging yards and some good contenders. And yesterday it was... Paul Nichols' his owner's day. Champion trainer. Champion trainer, and my word, he's got some really nice young horses. I think there was 48 horses in total that hasn't run for him yet, so really exciting times for him. Um, we spoke before the show, was there a few names to mention? I think from a Cheltenham Festival perspective and looking ahead, Mai Tai is a horse who ran to a good level last year. Harry Fry, of course, knows Stan Hurdlers, isn't he? You know what I mean, Harry, if a cat fits. He hopes this horse might be the sort of next one to go up that sort of trajectory. Um, he's half brother to Statler, so the trip should be fine. And yeah. Of the lesser known names, Hurricane Danny and Isaac Dezobo were names from the Nichols camp who were okay. particularly appealing. So maybe we'll be talking about them on the show one day. So there's again. Uh, uh, Isaac Dezobo yeah. and Hurricane Danny. Okay, so hopefully people have written those names down now. Uh, Keith Melrose at home in Huddersfield. Are you thinking about jump racing yet? No, I put the drawing line. It's I start after the arc. Right. I'll, okay. go, back, I'll go back to my staying chasers. It's after the arc's out of the way. Um, but yeah, this time of year, you always start hearing about them again. There's always, you know, 30, 40 Nichols horses that you're, you're getting excited about. And a, Nic a promising Nichols horse with Danny in his name has, has triggered me, unfortunately, because I just about rooted myself following Danny Wisbang a few years ago. So uh, there's always these Nichols horses that are really exciting and. Hopefully, a few of them are going to be stars. And uh, Keith, when are we going to get the latest edition of the Flat Pack? That comes out. It's always Tuesday evenings. Uh, it's usually it's six or seven o'clock. It comes out, and we're, we're filming this one again tomorrow. Uh, I head off, and I get to sit in a pub on a Tuesday morning with no shame attached to it at all, uh, because we're doing something very professional. Although it's not professional, as you know, it's very silly if you've seen the show at all. All in the name of hard work and dedication to the course. So this week we will be looking at the interference debate which continues to rage and Paul Hannigan had a fascinating guest column in the Racing Post today. We'll also be looking at racing's financial woes which like the rest of society are plentiful at the moment. But we're going to start off with a pure racing story and a story of two astonishing flat racehorses, Bayeed and Flightline. And in a normal year to have one of those would be uh, almost embarrassingly amazing. It would be incredible. But we've got two horses this year who are producing ridiculous figures. Keith Melrose, on Saturday evening, actually early on Sunday morning, I didn't stay up, I don't know if you did, I maybe wish I had done, uh, Flightline produced something quite remarkable at Del Mar. Tell us about Flightline and then we will discuss whether we can actually try and decide if one of the two is a better horse or if it's just impossible. Yeah, it's um, Flightline is this horse that I, I don't stay up either. And he's one of these horses that all your US fans and all the sort of US bent types were telling us from when he won the Malibu Stakes on Boxing Day last year. Oh, this is the next big thing. This is the next big thing. And normally, because I don't watch an awful lot of American racing, I'm, I'm waiting for it to, to really happen before I, I start to get excited. And by Joe, did it happen on Saturday night? That was quite something from Flightline. The, the sectionals he put in there, you know, he was running pace. From the, we're watching the start of the race now and from the winning post first time to the start of the back straight, he's running as fast as Minzal did when he won the Sprint Cup on Saturday. That's the sort of fraction we're looking at here. We know dirt racing's like that. It's all about early pace. And he did slow down a little bit at the end. So what 
He's even wide here. He's three, four off the rail as he comes in here. And here he's running something like 10 and a half, 11, no, it's 11 second furlongs he's running at this stage. And you can see the horse on the inside that tries to go with him. The main player's country grammar who ends up finishing second is in the white there in third just now. Just cannot go that pace at all. Country Grammar won the Dubai World Cup, of course, so his form's really strong, but he's more of a pure mile two horse. Flightline has just absolutely burned him off and kept going. It was an absolutely remarkable performance. Uh, it, we, we called it, it was compared very readily with Secretariat's winner in 1973 Belmont, which is possibly the most visually impressive performance any of us have ever seen on a race course. And, you know, this isn't, it's not like he's just, he's it's Sham disappearing out of the back of the telly. Country Grammar just cannot go the pace with him. It is a remarkable performance, and I think he well confirms being the best dirt horse probably since those days now on that evidence. Country Grammar down at the rail. Stiletto Boy Express train and still last as Royal Shub's going to come running, but he's got a good 10 lengths to make up on flight line. Let's see, a quarter of a mile to go in the Pacific Classic. Flavion Pratt and flight line are an embarrassing lead. It must be 15 lengths as they turn for home now. And let's see, Flavion Pratt just shakes the reins at flight line. And take a good look at this, because you're not going to see this too often, maybe never again. Flight line, 20 lengths clear. Flavion Pratt takes a hold and canters in in the TVG Pacific Classic. Won't see that very often, if ever, says Trevor Demon. Let's hope we do see performances like that again. It's why a lot of us are watching racing, isn't it? See these absolutely monstrous performances. But as I've been watching racing well over 20 years, and I've never seen a duck performance like that. I came into racing when Cigar was around. I've seen Arrogate go through. That is probably the best duck performance of the racing post up which goes back to the late 80s. You're going back to Secretariat, which you saw a performance like that. Yeah, it, w it was visually stunning, Keith, wasn't it? I, th I thought there were, there were also hallmarks of um, of Arazzi's Breeders' Cup Juvenile with that, that move around the home straight. Um, I guess the, the, the key thing, well, not the key thing now, because the, the key thing is just to enjoy great horses for what they are. But your job is to assess the quality of horses. Racing Post ratings have Bayed on a PB of 138 for his Judgment International. Um, we've given Flightline 140 for this victory here. How easy is it? Is it possible at all to try and compare these two horses? It is in a lot of sense. Ratings are there for that very purpose. And Flightline, we've got him on 140. We've I think we've been, if anything, our PRs have been quite conservative on Flightline and very positive about Bayid, and Flightline is still rated higher. The thing is with Flightline, the way he races lends itself to running these magic, ginormous figures on dirt because of the early pace he's going. He's going paces that, that basically break horses like Country Grammar. Now, he's a grade one winner, obviously won the Dubai World Cup Royal Ship. He's also a grade one winner, and he was seven lengths further behind Country Grammar. So we're looking at a horse, we're not, these horses haven't completely blown out, you know, the, there's there's an element of merit in, in, in what's happening here. And Flightline, even with nothing else running to higher than 102, has run to 140 on RPRs. That shows the level that we're talking about here, and he's got to be rated higher than by it. he simply has to, because of the margins involved, because of the times involved, because of the quality of opposition behind him and how far they were beaten. You know, he's beaten Country Grammar by about three times the length that Baid beat Mishrif in the Judmon. Um, but in terms of, you know, ratings are theoretical in a lot of senses, and it's very, very difficult to marry up a genuine in-flesh meeting between Baid and Flightline, uh, because, it's, you know, it's one thing to have when we had Dubai Millennium and Monju. There was talk about that being a matchup, and you had an easy circumstance under which they could have met. Frankel and Black Caviar, even when they were around at the same time, you could, they could have met over seven C bit. But it's just impossible to envisage a situation in which Flightline and Baid would match up uh, and, and give us a good fight. All we can say is that what Flightline's done, it's the perfect setup to run a massive figure, and that's exactly what he's done. He will almost certainly end the season higher rated than Baid, unless Baid turns up in the arc and does something ridiculous. I, I, but I'm not sure Baid's even got it. And then to do that, like what Flightline's done, I know we've got RPRs, he's rated 140, he's behind only Frankel now. You look at time form ratings, which go back even further, he's only got Brigadier Gerard, Tudor Minstrel, Minstrel Frankel and Siebert ahead of him. You know, anybody who's been doing ratings for a long time has this among their top handful of performances ever witnessed on a race course. So that's the level we're looking at here. It's so hard to 
really contextualise how high, how good a performance that was. He will be rated higher than Bide, but that's not to say that Bide's not going to. He's not. Well, Bide's the best turf horse since Frankel, in all likelihood. And, and he, Flag- sorry, I was going to say, James, uh, Keith, isn't it amazing? Therefore, that you can have a situation whereby, in all probability, when you look down the list of the world's best racehorses, Bide's name almost certainly based on what you said there, is never actually going to figure on it. It won't say at any point 2022 by Eid. He just won't figure in that list. And yet, as you say, he's the best turf racehorse since Frankel. It almost feels as though there's a bit of a flying ball Arkle scenario going on here. We've got one of the all-time greats who isn't going to be a, a champion in his own era. Yeah, he was arguably the best racehorse in the world last year by Eid, to yeah. be fair. But I don't think he got any award. I can't remember if he did win any awards or anything for that last year. He's not going to win it this year because of Flightline being there. You're absolutely right. There's an Arco flying boat thing going on in the sense that there's one, because champions, we only crown one, there's there's only going to be room for Flightline this year because the way he runs his races lends itself to massive figures. I was always sceptical, actually, that Bayeen even could run a figure like he ran in the Judmont because he'd won all his races beforehand in races where they went, very European races, the Americans would say to us, that they go relatively slowly and quicken up. And Baid is a horse that settles beautifully and quick and smartly, was always set up for those races, but they don't lend themselves to massive figures because you rarely put six, seven lengths into them. He did it at York and that allowed him to run his 138 on RPRs, but it's really hard to see a circumstance in which a horse that races like that runs to your 140 plus figures, you know, your Frankel level figures, how many times did it take Frankel to actually do it? It needed a well-run race. It needed everything to sort of start to tire behind him while he kept going. That's exactly what Flightline did doing his own legwork on Saturday. Baid will never do that, whether he runs in the arc or the champion stakes. That won't happen. So unless some other circumstances come in that mean he can put yawning gaps into the, the rivals, he's not going to match Flightline's level on form. Uh, James, was there much flight line talk at Ditch yesterday morning? Uh, no, unfortunately no, not. No, right. no, and no, it wasn't. Um, I thought it was exceptional, wasn't it? It was yeah. something really, really special to watch. And it's interesting seeing the comparisons, as you say, and it's, it's fascinating they were both come at the same time, you know. I suppose William Haggis probably is scratching his head a little bit and feeling a bit sorry for himself that he's finally got this superstar horse he's been training all his years for. And over in America, there's one that's possibly going to be the champion of 2022. Um, yeah, look, it's very easy to compare them. Um, they're one's dirt, one's turf. They're they're never going to race against each other. I think, in fairness to Baye, the thing that perhaps it deserves credit for is this horse has won a, a Group One this season in May, June, July, and August. You know, that's a hell of an achievement. And he's kept going for that. Flight lines of horse connections were sort of talking about him after the race and that they sort of just need to sort of keep giving a bit of t- time off and then he goes and produces those sort of performances and that's how they campaign him. So two different horses in that sense. I mean, probably the way that he runs and just completely destroys the opposition is partly why they want to absolutely get him right. So, you know, I think with Baid, he, he may not achieve that figure, but he's had a most extraordinary season and he's really lifted racing in a time where as we'll discuss it's been you know there's been a lot of issues but that judgment was a real super story and it'd be incredible if he turned up at Longshot. it'd just be the most incredible sort of european racing story wouldn't it if, if this horse can go through the ranks and and perhaps do it um yeah I, I think he will turn up at ascot i think that's probably going to be his option um they, you know they've talked about how sort of it's important his future career as a stallion and an exciting stallion he'll be but it's amazing having these two horses and it's great for the sport as well because nothing draws a crowd in like a real superstar and either size of the Atlantic, we've, we've certainly got them. We have indeed. Um, Kate, do you come in on those horses? Yeah, there's a couple of other things about them. Baid does take a lot less out of himself by way of, his way of racing. You know, with James alludes to it there. That's why he can turn up and run all these Group 1 performances one month after the other. And in that regard, the comparison is less uh, Frankel and Secretariat or whatever than it is Frankel and See the Stars. Because see, the stars turned up just about every month that season because he had a slightly more baid like racing style. Whereas Flightline, he must take loads out of himself putting up these big performances. Brilliant horse though he is. Another thing to mention about these two horses as well, which is really interesting, there's a lot going on now with the breeding for precocity in Europe in particular. And well, it's all about speed now and people have been moaning that. These two champions, neither of them raced it too. Frank, uh, Baid started in June last year. And Flightline only started in the April and only ran three times at three. 
So in an era where the sport is going towards more precocious breeding and more it's all about bang, 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 and then quickly cash in for stud value, the superstar horses, the one that bring the crowds in, don't need to rush those. Neither are running a group one until the autumn or nearly autumn of the three-year-old season. So it's, you know, a, a little boon for uh, the slower developer was among us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong there. Uh, you're absolutely right, Keith. You talk about the, the, the crowds and what brings in the crowds. Of course, I think over here, we're all now very much hoping that Bayid will sign off in the arc. And I actually wonder, James, I know you say you think he'll go to Ascot, although Keith makes a point quite rightly that the, the, the way European races are run will make it harder for Bayid to achieve that sort of uh, 140 figure. In all, in all probability, he won't be able to because of that, that reason. I just half wonder whether they will want to see him finish off with a performance of that sort of stature, and therefore they might well take him to, to Longchamp um, for that reason. But also... Um, the, 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 there was an article that Ron Wood has posted in, in a Members Club article today where he makes the point that although the, the connections have said that they would anticipate him racing on next year, his commercial value now is such that there will be an awful lot of pressure in some ways to just to draw stumps and maybe not even go to the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, no, I mean, you're looking at that and, and anyone who sort of has a top class mare and they're looking at breeding, he, he's, he's the horse now you're looking at going, God, this is, this is the one we want. Because you don't know what, obviously these horses race and you don't quite know what they're going to produce, but you're looking at a horse that's produced figures that are off the scale as, as Keith has alluded to there. And, and, you know, you're looking at a horse here that's really exciting, that, that's really untapped potential in terms of that. And, you know, we all know there's a certain super stallion, Galileo, who, who came and produced so many good horses. We, we, we're waiting for the next one. You know, we're waiting for that brilliant horse. And look, from what we've seen on the race course, it could be him. It could well be him. But look, it's early days. I hope he goes to the Breeders' Cup. And there was even talk that he might race on next season. So, you know, it'd be amazing if he carries on. And, and as, as I said, you know, it's the Breeders' Cup's going to be on ITV again. It's, you know, I hope that can draw in a, a good crowd to something different that's not just British racing that can expand the sport and expand the interest. You know, it's, it's great. Absolutely. And of course, the third thing about um, uh, Flightline 2 is that he is potentially a dream scenario for American racing. American racing has been in a lot of trouble in many ways, including with its public perception. And therefore, I think we just have to hope as well that Flightline isn't retired early and can have a secretariat career, star career of sustained excellence. You'd hate to think that American racing gets his dream racehorse and that he's gone almost as soon as he arrives. So fingers crossed we see much more of Flightline and a reminder that we'd all have to see Bayid in the arc as well. Well, we now know that Liz Truss is going to be the United Kingdom's next Prime Minister and at the top of her entry is to try and sort out the country's financial woes, woes that are being replicated elsewhere across the world and also in the sport of horse racing. There are many, many financial problems in the sport at the moment linked to rising energy prices and many other factors, but rising energy prices has been the big thing at the moment. Uh, we've heard in recent days uh, stories from high street bookmakers, from race courses and from racing participants talking about their fears as costs go up and up and up. In recent days, I've been down to see Harry and Christina Dunlop in Upper Lambourne and spoken to them and also spoken to Jonathan Garrett at Kelso in an effort to try and put some actual numbers onto this story. If we start with Harry and Christina Dunlop, they explained to me that they took their decision to leave the training ranks and they'll be having their final runners uh, at some point ne next month, largely due to rising costs. Some of those rising costs, their electricity bill has gone up from 2020 to 2022 by 121%, horse box fuel by 81%, chop grass feed by 49%. Those are costs that are being seen elsewhere across other racing yards. Jonathan Garrett at Kelso, the managing director there, he was telling me that up to the, in the year ending May 2022, their financial year, for heat and lighting, uh, they paid £48,273. They were offered a two-year fixed rate deal that would have equated in the current financial year to a bill of £257,000, a rise of 432%. Not surprisingly, Jonathan Garrett said, 
I'm not going to go along with that. He's taken a risk. He's gone for a variable rate. And the budgeted cost that that variable rate translates to is for this current financial year, £150,000, which in itself is still a 211% increase. On top of all that, we've got various other issues that racecourses are going to have to face at the moment. Levy board funding of racecourses is about to drop. It rose during COVID, which meant there was more levy board money being pumped into prize money. Well, that came partly from the levy board dipping into its reserves, but also from utilising a significant multi-million pound government loan. That benefit will end once we get into 2023, which means, as an example, Jonathan Garrett was telling me that their projections are that to run a £10,000, sorry, to run a Class 4 chase at their current £10,000 levels, which is above minimum prize money, they will have to put in an extra £923 of exec contribution just to stand still at £10,000 next year, which tells us the whole prize money debate, which constantly rages in horse racing, could be even more hot next year because racecourses are going to be finding it even harder to put in the money that they've already been putting in. So, James, for participants, for racecourses, for bookmakers, this is a huge, huge problem, just as it is almost certainly for all the households, all the people watching this programme now. Yeah, where to start, really, I yeah. suppose. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge concern. And, I mean, I was, as you mentioned at the start of the show, I was in quite a few yards, and it is a theme, you know, it's, it, things are costing more. And as you say, it's not just the fact that energy is costing more, it's the things you need, the fee, the things like that, they're all costing more. And so it's, it's just, you know, it's growing and growing and growing. And, and it is a concern. It's a massive concern. And I think the other thing as well, on the flip side, is that the prize money that we're competing for probably isn't matching the rise of the costs, which is unfortunately the same with a lot of the country and people's wages and such. So that's similar to, to what's happening in the country. I think the race courses is a, is a real area of concern for me as well, because I think as well with them, we know the attendances have been down. Yeah, key um, point. Yeah, the attendances are down and that's money through the gates. And also the field sizes are down, which will in, in theory is in, 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 uh, will go with betting turnover and... All that sort of stuff. So those two key elements that can turn over money for a race course is they're being nibbled away at. And so the money that they're getting is far from secure. And I suppose the bigger, wider picture is that now we're heading into a part of the season where attendances are tend to be down through the winter. It's, it's just what happens. You know, it's, it's a combination of different things, the weather being one of them. That's going to be where it's really interesting to see you know, national hunt racing, I've talked about it a bit already, that's a purist sport. You know, that's where people will go in every single, you know, if they know the meetings they like, they, they want to go to that one. Um, are they going to be turning up? You know, we've seen the dips in the summer racing. They obviously cost a bit more. You sort of get dressed up. You have a bit of a bet. You have a drink. You travel, whatever. That's quite a, a, a quite expensive day almost. And I'm not surprised that people who perhaps have less of a strong association racing decide not to come racing. But the national hunt sort of scene on the on the whole is more of a purist game. Those people who have loved the sport, what days are they not turning up to? Is that driven by cost? Is that driven to field sizes? They're the core of, of the audience that perhaps has been a little bit ignored in the last few sort of months and stuff. We talked about the sort of crown stuff. They're racing's key fans, and we need to make sure we are offering a product that they want to come and see. So that's where I'm concerned as well. But um, yeah, look, um, Liz Truss has got a, a lot to do. Um, I'll leave my opinions on her and, and what, what, what she stands for and, and the like um, away. But, you know, we're going to need some help. It's going to be tough. It's a bit of a perfect storm, isn't it, Keith? It is. It's coming out from all sides, isn't it? And as you're describing, everything that, that, that pushes people away is also pulling on the race courses. And, you know, that's, that's the nature of, of the situation that like we find ourselves in. And the fact that it is so widespread and not limited to racing means it might force its way up. I mean, when we when racing looks for government help, say, you know, we're always doing it uh, from a position of relative weakness. But here, this is just so wide ranging, this issue. It's going to apply to every business. It's going to apply to every household. You know, we've heard the, the scare stories about 70% of pubs having to close and hospitality being completely, well, not completely wiped out, but suffering deeply for this. So. Racing's in the same boat, and for that reason, that pure strength in numbers reason almost, it's in a very perverse sense, something's going to have to happen. There's, there's no, this, this, if this happens this winter and some of these worst things precipitate, the government's going to have a lot bigger worries than racecourse attendance is. So for that reason, I'm relatively hopeful something will come along, but we know from the history of how this government responded to COVID, etc., that they tend to do 
as little as it can get away with and later than they ideally should have. So still a wait to see what does happen. But, you know, it's it's going to be a really hard winter for absolutely everyone. We hope that National Hunt, being, as James says, that's a sport that people just are absolutely committed to. There's no transactional nature with jumps. People absolutely love it in a way that the, the flat doesn't seem to have quite the same warmth attached to it. Let, <laughs> are we relying on the fans' goodwill again? Well, it looks like it might be unless something comes along. But fingers crossed that this the government does recognise the, the gravity of this situation and we, we get something to help out. Well, certainly Jonathan Garrett's um, feeling when he was talking about um, that, that fixed rate um, energy deal offer that was accounts to £257,000 a year. His view was that he just feels that European heads of government, government here, will take the view um, that if they do nothing, businesses across all sectors will, will be failing and they can't afford to risk that. Um, and again, we should say that this applies everywhere. We, we had stories uh, in the last week um, of Irish racecourses facing huge rises in electricity and gas. This will be happening in, in France and, and all, all, all major racing nations. But I say the problem is it, it's happening, the fact it's happening in this major racing nation, one that already has significant funding issues to start off with. We're not starting from a great starting position or certainly not the position that many would want to be and we already we're already hearing participants crying out for more prize money and understandably so but that to see where that's going to come from now i think is is very hard you're hearing race courses saying that their entire profits could be taken up in in rising energy bills levy board funding as i say will, will be dropping as well it's hard to see where there's a a golden egg waiting to be waiting to be cracked yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And I think the, you know, you read the news now, and as Keith mentioned, the pubs are shutting. I think Bristol Zoo as well, you know, big, big events, big, big places that have been around for years and years are closing because they can't, they can't compete. You know, we are going to lose hospitality businesses. It's just the way. And race courses, I'm sure, are aware that other race courses around them and, and such, they are going to be struggling. And there may be a few difficult decisions to make. I mean, I hope I hope it doesn't end up in closures and I don't, don't hope that doesn't happen. But, you know, we are reaching that point of real emergency. I think at this point it's extremely important that, you know, this sport has a lot of um, disagreements. You know, we, we've spoken about this here before where it just decisions can't be made. I think, look, we need to approach this situation collectively, you know, together, you know. This sport has a lot of different voices and, you know, we've got, got a new person in the BHA now for communications, you know. I think the important thing with government and when we can present what our sport is, is offering is that it's not bickering. It needs to, we need to come together and really just work out, OK, this is what the sport needs. You know, we need to work out those key issues, things like the fixture list, things like the financing and prize money. It is absolutely crucial because... If, if racing is being looked at by government and things like that and, and it can't make its own mind up, well, how can government step in and try and help su financial support? So I think that's going to be a real area. Um, I think we, we are reaching sort of emergency point for this sport at, at this point in time. So it's important that we, we sort of act really quickly, I think. You just mentioned there, you mentioned the new person going into comms at the BHA, yes. the new director of communications, Greg Swift, who joins having just now finished his role as head of news and press secretary to none other than Liz Truss. So certainly a big connection there will be formed between horse racing and the new prime minister. Just to end this section, we don't want to sound all doom and gloom. I know some people get frustrated if they think that racing journalists and racing media are constantly sounding negative. Let's end on, on two positive notes on this story. When I saw Harry and Christina Dunlop last week, they were both stressing that although it's time for them to walk away from training and they have no doubt that others will follow, Harry was saying he still loves this sport. They both love this sport. They see lots of positives in this sport. They see that people going to yearling sales are still spending fortunes on horses more and more every year. So there is still an appetite to be involved in horse racing and on the race course front Jonathan Garrett a Gelso again saying listen these are very difficult times and we are going to have to cut our cloth accordingly we're going to have to spend less money on maintaining things away from the race course itself that we would normally have maybe spent money on but he made the point that what this might mean now the, these rising costs is that race courses make changes that they would have had to make 
in the future anyway, in terms of how they spend their money and how they spend their, their energy spend, if you like. And they might make positive changes that they would have had to make in a few years' time, but they'll have to bring those forward. So it's good to hear people who are at the coalface, both in terms of race courses and participants, trying to look on the, on the positive side of this situation. And uh, let's hope all that positivity does bear fruit over the coming years. Right, our third story this week is being presented by James Stevens. And James, you have been looking at the interference debate, which is still as hot as ever. Yes, yeah, so we finally had the result um, for the Norfolk Stakes. The, the placings remained unaltered after many, many months and a six-hour hearing, which I think Chris Cook is still recovering from. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, so the Riddler held on to the result, and since then we've sort of discussed that open point of interference. It was a significant bit of interference. The horse came across the middle of a track, um, and it was a sort of an interesting race to look at and, and the various different points. But I think the key thing to come out of it was the, the panel calling for a broad review of interference, um, which, as you said, has been a hot topic. We, of course, had Free Wind, um, who was, uh, Rab Havlin had the result sort of, his careless riding ban for sort of interference wiped out before even going to the panel. That was the sort of key one. Tom yep. Markand picked up a, something for careless riding as well. So this whole sort of penalty structure, the whole idea of interference is something interesting. Um, the BHA sort of commented after that when in response to that sort of idea of a broad review that um, sort of other jurisdictions are more coming in line to our way of dealing with it. So it didn't feel like there was much urgency to sort of look at it. But I think it, there is a, a call for it. I mean, Paul Hannigan has spoken this afternoon, or yesterday afternoon, and the comment page about sort of how the system works and how a jockey can sort of break the rules. They can sort of just, just, just do what they can, and they accept a few days off. You know, they can, you know, it's sort of not necessarily allowed, but it's a risk that they're willing to take. He's talked about how it's not just at the end of races, at the start, and all the different things that just paint a little bit of a murky picture about how the sport looks and how jockeys can do all to win all. I mean, look, it happens in sport, you know, people dive in football, you know, it's that idea of win at all costs advantage. But look, we need to have a look at this again, I think is the right time now to look at how interference is happening in racing, what can be done to make sure the results are as fair and accurate as they would if there wasn't interference. And we should say as well, at the moment, the BHA had already announced that there would be a review of of penalties yeah. um, and th that will one would imagine will likely yield stiffer penalties Keith um, in Paul Hannigan's column today he paints um, a pretty stark picture of jockeys um, senior and not senior both pushing rules to the boundaries at the start of races and at the end of races uh, of doing things that they know they really shouldn't do but they do them because they believe they will get away with them in the sense that they won't get a ban that maybe is as severe as it should earn. Um, and he also spoke of inexperienced jockeys perhaps being particularly culpable in a way that wasn't the case in the past and of a weighing room culture that has changed with younger jockeys perhaps showing less respect to, to older jockeys and being less keen to take advice because of a, an increased level of, of cockiness. It was a pretty, as I say, a stark column what he said, did that ring true with you from what you see on racecourses day in, day out? Um, yeah, well, certainly what happened with Hannigan at Ascot was uh, I'd adhered to that because the panel conclusions talked about how vastly experienced Paul Hannigan is, which of course he is. He's ridden over 17,000 times according to those panels members there. But my thought, which I read that before I read Paul's column today, was, well, yeah, that means Paul knows exactly what you can get away with. And he just confirmed that when, when his column, that's exactly what he said. He said that, that we know what we can do, we know what will get us suspensions, and we've made the calculation before the stalls open. Yes, I'm making split-second decisions, and he claims not to have felt the extent to which the Riddler, Riddler drifted at Ascot, but he knew before they left the stalls what he could, what he felt he knew he could get away with and what would be the trade-off between his day's holiday, uh, his day's bans, and his, uh, his you know, return for winning the Norfolk Stakes. So the panel basically turned around and said the law's an ass. The perpetrator in this case has turned around and said the law's an ass. And we are still in a position where not much is going to get done about it. Now, the BHA made pretty swinging changes with the whip rules about 10 years ago now and ended up getting mocked by Christoph Sumion asking Nick Luck for, uh, to scadge a taxi off him. So I think there may be a little bit burned still by that, but... There's the, the attitude for changes there. The jockeys they know what they're doing is is potentially quite dangerous. As a, you know, there's 
the sort of threat is that what will make people wake up is somebody getting seriously hurt. And we hope it doesn't come to that. It shouldn't have to come to that. We know what professional sportsmen are like in all other sports in terms of what they're willing to do to their bodies. You know, we're not talking about racing here, but we're talking about athletes and the sort of things they'll put their bodies through in order to gain a competitive advantage. We shouldn't imagine that jockeys are without some fairly stiff, you know, impetus one way or the other going to make these decisions themselves to be safer or if you know in terms of taking fewer risks that they know the trade-off benefits them if they take that risk and it leads to them winning a race so it's i can't i can't blame the jockeys because they're elite athletes and i see elite athletes in every sport pushing the limits of what's allowed and what's possible why should jockeys be any different but it's not for the jockeys to decide what the punishments are they know what the punishments are paul hannigan's told us that and they know that the way things are set up at the moment benefits them being naughty sometimes, quite frankly, and that's what that's where the, that's the, that shows you the direction the change needs to come from. If I was just playing well, devil's advocate, that's what you, you you could say that it's right that elite sports people will always push the boundaries, but jockeys do know that what they're doing now, based on what Paul Hannigan was was saying there, is creating dangerous scenarios on race courses. You don't need to have an increase in the in the penalties for burglary for us not to start burgling and yeah. robbing people you know you, you there's a the people know right and wrong but equally I'm, I'm sure that keith is right about professional sports people they will always push the boundaries but it has to be encouraging that there seems to be from what paul says a consensus view in the weighing room that where we are now is not where we should be and if the actual people who the bha is regulating want tighter stronger harder regulation then it should hopefully be quite easy for the bha to implement that something else that i thought was interesting in in the in the piece uh james was paul talking about those younger members of the weighing room saying that um quoting me i would generally know when not to put a horse in a position where that horse would likely to suffer interference too many young riders now seem unable to do that i've never seen so many inexperienced jockeys either putting themselves in danger or causing interference and he goes on to say the culture has changed a bit of respect he's gone that young jockeys now have levels of arrogance that was not the case when he was starting out and they're not prepared to go to senior riders for advice in the way they used to now that's paul's that's paul's take on it from someone who's in the weighing room is that something that you'd heard before you speak to a lot of jockeys in your job yeah well obviously jockeys don't tell me that they're arrogant or not but yeah i, I can sort of understand that i mean there's an idea in the the young, the young ones coming through, but I, I think there's there's always been that to an extent that someone that's young, they're ambitious. I think that, that the element of that, whereby a, a jockey gets themselves in a in a difficult situation or, or or the like, that's a bit that's a bit that might help uh, change sort of where a jockey's career is going to end up. You know, a jockey that can sort of go in and understand the race and get on with an older jockey and find out things that may separate them from the rest. That may be what makes them stand out a little bit more. Um, in terms of that sort of culture and that sort of acceptance, I, I sort of get what you're saying by, you know, the idea of winning at all costs and, and things like that and the, and the punishment system. I think, for me, the way that this may have to go and what I would consider as an option is that if you're going to commit an offence on a said day, say in the Norfolk, you should miss a day, not just any day's riding, but a day with a listed or a group race on. Yeah. Because that would, say, encourage someone to be more careful or not to take the risks. I mean... The whole thing just strikes me as a little bit weird. We call it careless riding. But then Paul Hannigan is saying, well, it's not careless at all because it's fought through and uh, this is what I've yeah. accepted to do. Yeah. So how can we judge something that's careless if the jockeys are saying, well, it's not careless. I intended to do it. It just makes no sense, does it? So it's, it's, it's a really, really interesting area. And look, I hope... I hope the BHA do review it wider and you know if they decide not to change anything then they decide not to change anything but look it's an area that we sh definitely should be looking into because the more we look at it the more work that's done the better the sport will be. The, the thing that Hannigan came out and said about you know the, all the, the youngsters and how they've got the more arrogance now my first reading of that I thought a little bit it was all the kids these days was the sort of tone of it but it's not it's actually not unrelated to the earlier point about sport and the general pushing of boundaries you know I, jockeys now coming through they are they see themselves more as athletes in a way that jockeys 20 years ago even probably wouldn't have seen themselves and it almost comes from the same place potentially of you know we are professional athletes and our job here is to win and it's come at the same time as better training regimes for jockeys and you know better nutritional uh, advice to jockeys it's, it's probably coming from a not dissimilar place 
It's a fascinating subject and one would at least hope that with that groundswell of momentum among jockeys that something has to be done, that this could at least be a subject where action can be taken by the BHA more easily than will be in the case of the financial situation that we discussed earlier. OK then, we've reached the time of the programme where it falls upon me with uh, no democratic base whatsoever to decide which of these stories should be our winning story for this week. Um, both James and I, I think, presented very strong stories. My goodness, they're, they're strong stories in terms of racing's financial uh, problems at the moment and the, the issues with interference on race courses. And they clearly, obviously, uh, could be uh, the winning story in this week. But I'm actually going to say on this occasion, Keith Melrose and that debate about Flightline and by you should win because ultimately, although we discuss this a lot as an industry, first and foremost, horse racing must always be a sport and the sport's biggest stars are the horses. And at this current time, we have two horses who are so exceptionally good that um, they are a, they're a joy to watch and we might not see horses as good as that again for years. So, Keith, on that basis, your discussion of Flightline and his relative merits to Bayid is the winning story in your first week. That is a mighty achievement, sir. Thank you very much. No, it's just a joy to watch those horses, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, we, we, it's, it puts this idea of racing that the sport is about top performers at the end of the day and the top performers are always got four legs and it's great to watch these horses we're probably waiting on average you know hopefully it's sooner on average it'll be 10 years before we see a horse like these two again so we've got at least two races coming up in the autumn whether it's the arc of the champion stakes and hopefully the readers cup classic to enjoy them afresh and uh, it's what gets you sort of out of bed in the morning to, to watch these races as a prospect of seeing something like we saw on saturday Beautiful, beautiful words, and I would echo all of them. OK, thank you then to, to James and to Keith, and thank you for watching. I would just say before we go, we have an offer at the moment for Racing Post Members Club. Fantastic service it provides with access to the digital newspaper from 9pm the night before the print newspaper comes out. Great tipping, great writing, features, race replays, all on the Racing Post Members Club. And you can get 50% off your first three months membership by clicking on the link that you see on the screen now. OK, good luck with doing that. Thank you for watching. We'll be back again next week. Until then, bye-bye.